A while ago, I made a video about Duskers, which I called the scariest game on PC. And while that game is scary, I have to take it back, because that title easily goes to Cry of Fear. I had never heard of this game until someone sent it to me about a month ago, and I'm so happy they did. I've been dying to talk about this game, trying to figure out the right way to present it. I don't want to say too much, because honestly I want you to play it. If you're a horror fan, you owe it to yourself to give it a try, if you're on PC. It's free on Steam, so why not? This video will contain some light spoilers for some boss encounters and scary scenes, but I'm going to try to keep it to a minimum. Cry of Fear is an independent horror game that comes out of Sweden, built on the Gold Source engine from Half-Life 1. Half-Life came out in 1998, and this game came out in 2012. So you've got a fairly recent game built in the engine of a much older game, so you can't compare it visually to other games that released contemporaneously, but we'll get more into the visuals later. When playing Cry of Fear, if you know your horror games, the first thing you'll notice is that the game gives off some serious Silent Hill vibes. And that's not a comparison that I toss around lightly. Silent Hill is royalty in the world of horror, and I never compare anything to it. So take this as the highest compliment. I'm gonna make a lot of comparisons to Silent Hill, and that's a good thing. If your game gets me to compare it to Silent Hill, you've done something right. And not just Silent Hill in general, specifically Silent Hill 2 and 4. The alleyways and streets feel like Silent Hill 4, as do the dreamy performances of the characters, and the first-person perspective in the apartment, and the bizarre otherworldly sections that don't seem to make sense. It's all very Silent Hill 4. But then you've got maps like the apartments, these creepy corridors that feel more like Silent Hill 2. It's like if you took those games and carefully mixed them with Fear from 2005, which isn't strictly a horror game since it's a first-person shooter, but you have moments that feel lifted straight from it. That isn't to say that Cry of Fear is unoriginal, it's very much its own game in many ways. It's just that it pays loving tribute to the classics, using tried and true gameplay mechanics and visual tricks. I make these comparisons in total flattery and praise. In this video I'm going to talk about the good and the bad, because there's a fair amount of both. Cry of Fear is a wonderful horror experience that is occasionally screwed up by some big issues, mostly technical. If you can deal with occasional frustration and some questionable design decisions, there is gold here. After I beat the game, I decided I needed to play through it again to better understand it, as a game and as a story. I went online to research the game, watching videos that explain story points and characters, and learning about the developers behind it. This is a game made with a lot of love and passion, and that gets more and more obvious as the game goes on and it gets more ambitious. The first levels of the game are really the weakest parts, and that's a real shame because if your first levels don't grab the audience, you'll lose a lot of them. But this is something seen in indie games sometimes, especially when the first levels are actually the first ones they design. The developers get smarter and more creative as they spend years making the game, so of course the first levels they design are going to be less interesting than what comes later. It reminds me of Dusk, which was released in three episodes. The first episode is alright, the first levels have a similar feel, taking place in the woods or farms or mines, and the enemies aren't that interesting. The first episode just kinda shows the potential of the game. And then when episode 2 and 3 came out, suddenly the developer is flexing his new skills, taking us to military installations crazy underground power facilities, secret laboratories that bend the laws of physics, and the level design and enemies get much more imaginative and fun. Remembering how Dusk evolves in that way, I let my initial frustrations with Cry of Fear slide to see what would come later. I would end up angry about something that I thought was bullshit and want to stop playing, but then I'd think about how much I was enjoying the atmosphere and that the game had truly frightened me several times at this point. So I'd set aside my feelings and push forward. Fortunately, the positives the game establishes at the start are strong enough to push past the negatives, because there are some negatives here. Cry of Fear was built as a Half-Life mod, and I don't come from the Half-Life mod scene. I don't know the ins and outs of the Source engine, it's all new to me, so I had some learning to do. First there's the crouch jumping, hitting crouch and jump together to get some kind of a jump boost and slide into an area that's too small for your standing hurt box. Some areas make it pretty clear that you need to jump and crouch in some way to make it through. So someone unfamiliar with crouch jumping will need to experiment to figure that out. But there are some areas where it completely escaped me. There are vents that you seemingly can't pass through even though you're crouching. You have to crouch next to them and then crouch jump to shove your character through. It's pretty weird. 
There's one area where you have to crouch jump through a bus window and it's just awkward as all hell. Putting aside the fact that I didn't even notice the open window here and then ended up running around lost for 30 minutes, even if I had noticed it and tried to crouch jump through, it's easy to fail several times because of the awkward angle and the diagonal map on the bottom that makes you slide away from the window. So you can fail to get through and be left thinking, all right, well, I guess I'm not supposed to go this way. And then you'll end up lost again. There are collision issues in the game where your character will just get stuck on textures. The entrance to the apartments has a scaffolding section that has some of these problems, showing the game's jankiness to the player way too early when they should be throwing their best stuff at you. You can't walk through this hole in the wall, you have to crouch, but then as you move back through the hole from the other side, you can just walk through normally. The collision problems can lead to some really frustrating moments of platforming too. You can get caught on something when you're trying to run and jump. What's weird about the jumps is that you need to jump a little after you've crossed the edge of a platform sometimes, or else you won't make it across. It feels unintuitive, and I still kind of struggle with it. The other technical issue is the instability of the game. This game is going to crash on you, not all the time, and not in every section. The first parts of the game are pretty stable, but if you get hit by a train, it's probably going to crash. If you fall in this platforming section, crash. Maybe you'll finish a long boss battle and go to open the door that leads to the save point, and crash. Luckily the game never crashed in the first hours, or else I may have been really turned off. All these technical issues I'm describing are forgivable though. For a small independent team building their own game in an old engine, I can let it go because a lot of the game plays great for what it is. But I did find myself raging several times at this game, having to put it down for a bit and come back later. When the game is firing on all cylinders, it impresses like nothing I've played in the last 15 years. They achieve a very impressive, somber, immersive atmosphere with the simplest of techniques. Look at this view here. It's just a flat walkway, a rolling texture for water, and a flat image of a skyline. It's so simple, yet so effective. The game feels lonely and depressing at times, really hitting that Silent Hill 2 and 4 mood. There are atmospheric sounds that I swear sound like they're ripped straight from Silent Hill 3. The music is also very Silent Hill, with original tunes written by the game's creator, and these songs fit perfectly. The sound design in general, not just the music, is fantastic. 10 out of 10. There's a lot of audio misdirection and horrifying monster screams. Sometimes the game makes you want to run away in terror just because of something you hear. Sounds that make you want to close the game and hide under the covers. Striking visuals and a sense of disorientation create an ominous tone that builds and builds almost to a breaking point. I can honestly say this is one of the scariest games I've ever played. Scary in three important ways. Dread, where you simply don't want to enter an area because of what could be there. Horror, where you're shaken by something you've encountered or seen. And quality jump scares that capitalize on the strengths of the first two points. Jump scares are not a bad thing. They're only bad when they're overused and cheap and not at the service of establishing the tone of an experience. They get a bad reputation because they're used so liberally in cheap teen horror movies to get the audience to scream. But there's nothing wrong with a good jump scare when the mood is right. 
1979's Alien has a jump scare as its first scary moment when the facehugger jumps out. And it's perfect. It's not bad just because it's startling. It complements what's happening. Cry of Fear absolutely nails the jump scares. I'm not exaggerating when I say I screamed 30 or 40 times in my first playthrough. They happened fairly regularly and I never got tired of them. The game kept me on the edge of my seat in several sections, and because of the horrific enemy design and their even more horrific sounds, I got scared by things that I could see coming from a mile away. When the game starts, there's only one combat option, the knife, and it's really bad. At least Silent Hill 2 gave you a longer range option with a wooden plank. Enemies take too many stabs to take down, and you'll get hit a lot. You're supposed to learn to backdash after each attack to avoid damage. It's an interesting system where you can dodge in any direction by tapping the key twice. It's tricky to get the hang of on your first playthrough, and even when you master it, it's not very satisfying because the melee combat takes too long and feels repetitive. There's a lot of combat in this first section with the knife, and these opening combat encounters feel confusing and tedious. It wouldn't be so bad if there weren't so many enemies. Having to stab and backdash over and over to get through these first sections, while pausing to wait an eternity for your stamina to recharge before you fight the next guy just isn't a good way to start things off. Even if you're a veteran, I recommend playing this game on normal or medium. It's punishing enough, trust me. The monster designs are mostly good to great, with a few that are just kinda meh. The blade ladies scare me every time, so do the faceless enemies. The models are really stiff and jerky with low polygon design, giving off a sense of the unnatural that leads to the player experiencing discomfort as well as fear. Like in Quake 1 where the monsters are horrific but you can't even really tell what you're looking at. Or like Silent Hill 1 with its flayed corpses and barbed wire. There's something about low polygon graphics that enhance horror. I think it's because horror usually plays on the unknown. You're scared in the dark because you can't see. I think the better that graphics get and the more detailed monsters are, the more they lose what makes them scary because it's easy to understand what we're looking at. Maybe that's a part of why the later Silent Hill games fail. It's far scarier to be in a dark hallway seeing a hazy twitching figure in the distance that you can't identify and you just know you don't want anything to do with it. The fear of the unknown also works well with the sound design. When you hear something next door and you're unsure if it's an enemy that's going to attack you, or maybe something is happening in there to another person and you're left to imagine what it could be. Sometimes it can be easy to look at a creature portrayed so simply and say, oh well that doesn't look good, but you gotta keep in mind this is built independently in an engine that's 20 years old. They did a pretty good job, and you have to shift your perspective a bit to get into it. Cry of Fear shines brightest when it's dark, when the horrible creatures are hidden in the shadows, blurred by surreal dreamscapes. Even something you've seen 10 times already can scare you when the mood is set right with the lighting and sonic ambience, which makes it puzzling why enemies are also shown in brightly lit areas. It strips all the scariness away from them, and now they're just video game bad guys that you gotta shoot. I really wish some places like the subway were lit sparingly instead of full on bright. I mentioned earlier that I wish there weren't so many enemies, and that's actually a criticism I have about the whole game. I think the game has too much action. I'm not saying it feels like an action horror game like Dead Space, but I think if you cut the number of enemies in half, it would make combat encounters feel more special. Sometimes I feel like nearly every room has something for me to kill in it, and it takes away from the slow and somber tone the game establishes. Of course, if you were to reduce the number of enemies, you'd need to reduce the amount of ammo and health to compensate. Which takes me to the inventory. Cry of Fear has a classic 90s survival horror style inventory. You can hold 6 items, regardless of their size. I think it would be better for small items to take up smaller spaces, but it is what it is. 3 items of your choosing can be assigned to quick keys 1, 2, and 3, so you can have a shotgun in slot 1, your cell phone in slot 2 for lighting dark areas, and the pistol or a melee weapon in slot 3. 
That's just an example, you can have other stuff in these slots. In the menu, you can select an item and then dual wield it with another. This is crucial for exploring dark areas by using a weapon and the phone together. You don't have to do it in menu. If you have two items assigned to quick keys, you can just press those two keys together and now you're dual wielding. Switching weapons and reloading is very slow, so don't expect to be running around like an action hero in this game. For a veteran survival horror fan like myself, being careful with my ammo management, my first playthrough kept me in a nice spot of rarely being too low on ammo and never having an abundance. And I imagine for an inexperienced player, they'll be in a stressful situation quite often. And that's good, that's how it should be. One aspect I love is that reloading a clip disregards the bullets from the previous clip. I think that touch of realism helps add another level of tension on top of the combat encounters. I have a few bullets in my clip, and I want to have a full clip in case I run into two or more enemies in the next room, but if I reload now, I'm throwing away these bullets. So do I open the door now and hope for the best? Shoot an enemy and then run away and try to reload before the other ones get me? I could do that, but what if the room is dark and I need to dual wield the cell phone? If you're dual wielding, you can't reload the gun, so I'll have to shoot the guy, run away, switch to holding only the pistol, then reload, and by that point I could be dead. I like to set up the quick keys like I said before, shotgun in slot 1, phone 2, pistol 3, I'll go in with low ammo for the pistol, dual wielding the cell phone, and if things get crazy, I can switch to the shotgun. There's a really strange meta that kind of turns conventional survival horror on its head. Normally you would think, okay, I'm going to save my shotgun shells for serious combat situations and boss fights, so I'll use my pistol for everything else. But if you do that, you run the risk of depleting all your pistol ammo, and you cannot dual wield the shotgun with the cell phone. So you could end up with no pistol ammo, walking around with just the cell phone, and then switching to the shotgun when you see enemies and having to fight in the dark. It's a really interesting way of encouraging the player to use different weapons and manage their ammo economy. It reminds me a lot of... I'm not gonna do it. You know what game I'm thinking of. Since we're on combat, I gotta say that it's not this game's strength, but it's generally solid. The only real combat issue is the boss fights. They aren't very good. They're necessary for closing out important chapters, so I don't mind them. Silent Hill bosses aren't very good either. I don't know if that's an excuse though, they just aren't very interesting. Take this fight against Mace. He's a big, slow, hulking threat with a one-hit kill melee attack. You can't hurt him, you have to outmaneuver him and turn some valves to overload a generator that electrocutes him. And then you have to run over to the platform to get out of the water so you don't die. In concept, this is a good foundation for a boss fight. It's just too simple. I think there should have been more complexity to it, like having to dodge an attack, hit him for a quick stun, and then turn the valve. Just something more than running around the room in circles until you hit the levers and he dies. The city and locations have plenty of little avenues for exploration, which is commonly rewarded with ammo or health pickups. You'll come back to previous places and find that you have access to new areas. You'll find several weapons through the game which are mostly satisfying to use. I especially like the hunting rifle. But due to tight inventory space, you can't walk around as a one-man army. That's a good decision. You'll have a full inventory of weapons and supplies, and then you'll find a key, and what are you gonna do? You gotta drop something. That leads me to a small issue the game has though. Oftentimes you'll find a key and have to drop a weapon, then you run to the door, open it, run back to get the weapon, and then run back to the door. It's an unfortunate side effect of having a limited inventory and allowing the player to drop items wherever they want. And if it's a weapon, you'll have to reassign it to the quick key every time. Maybe the game would have benefited more from a Resident Evil style system with magic chests. Dropping items is cool, but there's no way to see where you dropped them because, and this is one of the biggest issues with Cry of Fear, there is no map. There are city maps at the bus stations to check where you are, and they are sort of helpful. But you cannot take any maps with you, so if you drop an important item somewhere and you don't remember where it is, you're totally screwed if you can't find it. Resident Evil Zero did this right by showing where you left items on your portable map. The lack of a map severely impacts the enjoyment of the first true area of the game, the apartments. There are multiple floors with identical hallways filled with doors that are either busted or locked, and it's easy to get disoriented and forget which direction you're going, which doors you've already tried to open. In a game with such obvious appreciation for Silent Hill, I can't believe there aren't maps to assist in navigation. The levels after the apartments aren't as difficult to understand, so the map situation isn't so bad. But again, it just goes to show how the game has a number of questionable design decisions that hamper the opening chapters. Speaking of difficult to understand, we gotta talk about the puzzles. 
There are a few puzzles, some good ones too. Some very Silent Hill and Resident Evil style puzzles, which I fucking love. I love a good cryptic riddle with buttons to move objects to unlock a door. I got so excited when I saw this area here. Let me just say that I love the idea of this puzzle. I want to say that first before I get into the problems with it. There's four statues, an eagle, an owl, a horse, and a tiger, lion, a big killer cat. Each statue is on a cross and can be moved with a press of the corresponding switch. We also find a compass, so we can match it with the statues and see that the horse, for example, is in the south position. Making our way up to the top, we have a riddle. Let's read it together, shall we? Silently she flew, quiet as a whisper in the dark. She came upon a river and headed south. The king of all the birds flew higher than the owl, gloating as he went. Four-legged carnivore sneaked side by side to his prey, ready to strike whenever a movement was made. The equestrian beast didn't want her sleep to come, so she fled to the west uncalm. Okay, so right from the start we have two obvious answers. The owl is going south and the horse is going west, so we go down and put those two in the right positions. The first problem with the riddle is that the eagle is said to be flying higher than the owl, but what does that mean? Higher? We're talking about directions on a compass. There is no higher. If the answer is meant to be north, well, north is not higher than south. North isn't up. North is north. Sure, if you look at a globe, north could be said to be up, but there's no up or down in space. So maybe they mean that both the owl and the eagle are flying south, but the eagle is flying higher? Or maybe the eagle being higher than the owl means that it's in the center position, which I guess could be considered on top of the owl? Is the center position even an option in this puzzle? Can you see how this is confusing? And what about the lion? It says that he's walking parallel to the horse. What does that mean? If the horse is going west, then the lion would also have to be going west if they were in parallel to each other. Or maybe putting the lion in the center position means that he's next to the horse, so maybe that's parallel? Or maybe putting the lion in the east position means that they are now on opposite sides and therefore in parallel? I mean, if north equals up, then why wouldn't opposite sides be parallel? But that would mean that the horse is in the west and the lion is in the east and they are then both walking north or south in parallel. But the riddle says the horse is walking west, he's not in the west. What the hell is going on? Anyway, turns out the solution is to put the eagle north because north is apparently higher than south and the lion is actually going west with the horse. What a great classic puzzle design spoiled by confused wording. Not every puzzle has issues though. The statue one is really the big offender. There are other puzzles that are well designed and creative. Now I haven't talked much about the story because I don't want to give things away. I know I keep coming back to Silent Hill, but it's a lot like how you can't tell someone the story of a Silent Hill game without completely spoiling it. All I can say is that Simon gets hit by a car and spends the rest of the game trying to understand what's going on. You'll probably think you've figured it out pretty early on, but a greater understanding of the game reveals that not to be the case. If you think this is just a copy of Jacob's Ladder, you're mistaken. The voice acting is… okay. English isn't their first language, so it's understandable that the performances are inconsistent. And there's a grammatical mistake here or there. The performances feel a bit unnatural and stiff, but in a way it works with the tone of the game. The whole game is awkward and surreal, so any acting issues are pretty easily forgiven. You'll need to have subtitles on when you play because some of the dialogue is nearly inaudible. The story is dark and just gets darker. Don't play this if you're looking for happy resolutions. This game doesn't care about how you feel at the end of it, and I respect them for sticking to their vision, as bleak as it is. You probably won't fully understand the story when you finish it, but Cry of Fear is the kind of game that leaves you thinking about it, and you'll want to go online and see what other people say, study story interpretations, and piece it all together. The game has four different endings and a secret joke ending, there's different ways to interpret moments of the story, there's lots of symbolism and metaphors in the game, how much of it was intentional is up to you to decide. Maybe some of these moments were carefully crafted to represent something, or maybe it was just made to be scary and anything you take from it is your own idea. But at the end of the day, it's a captivating experience. There's a lot of stuff I'm choosing not to show in this video. I'm not showing the intro section, I'm not showing a lot of the surreal environments. I don't want to spoil it. I want you to play this game and experience it for yourself. 
If you're looking for a more in-depth analysis, that stuff is out there on other channels. I'm just trying to introduce a new audience to this gem. It's far from perfect, but Cry of Fear is a must-play if you're a fan of classic horror games. It's been a long, long time since I've played a game made by people who really understand how to make a game like this, and I suspect it'll be a long time until I do again. Thanks for watching, you can subscribe to this channel for more videos on whatever the hell I feel like talking about. Now go play Cry of Fear!